Oh, brother, we do have an idea of what happened. I'm losing my fucking mind. No, you can't say that it is like, oh, it's a 50-50 split. There, it's like there's 99% evidence pointing in one direction, and the 1% evidence on the other direction is the bombing campaign facilitator saying, we didn't do this one. That's it. That's it. There is no evidence. There, the only evidence that everyone's pointing to is some fucking limp dick OSINT account that was literally saying a fallen piece of shrapnel caused the largest explosive, most damaging strike so far in 75 years of conflict. After the fact, openly admitted that Egypt had no fucking first strike capability and had no interest in fighting, okay? And, and were, would never be able to fight. That's it. That's the summarization of this video. But there you go. I saved you guys 18 minutes. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Here, let's the watch. present day and gave us the occupied territories. In just six days, Israel was in control of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and the Sinai Peninsula. By 1982, Israel had pulled out of the Sinai completely, even dismantling settlements in the process. But as for the rest of the territories, Israel remains earnestly in control, despite what Israeli officials say about Gaza. There already exist uh, two states for the Palestinians, one in uh, Gaza, a full-blown state run by Hamas. Israel's own leading expert on- Yeah, no, totally, dude. That's definitely, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I love, I love having a state run by Hamas, which doesn't have an airport because Israel bombed it in 2001 and wouldn't allow it to be rebuilt for fucking years. And then, and then they pulled their, their settlers out of Gaza and turned it into a full-blown open-air prison. An open-air prison in which you have no control over what kind of supplies you get. An open-air prison that Israel controls the humanitarian aid that goes into. Okay? So sick. So sick. People always say the most callous, horrific, monstrous shit when talking about Gaza. It makes me fucking lose my mind. I have to be so goddamn kind to people whenever they say stuff like, oh, well, the UNRWA or the, the United Nations has a literal uh, special refugee class for Palestinians. Um, by the way, that's literally how bad Israel is, by the way, that the, the, the UN had to be like, we have a special division specifically created for the fucking fallout of that. OK, uh, and they've gotten billions of dollars over the years. Why don't they just build stuff? It's like, what can they build? They can't have fucking concrete. They can't. They can't have anything. They, they don't. It's so stupid. I hate that. It's so callous. You will never understand what that's like. You will never understand what that's like because you've never lived in an open air prison. What the fuck? Except for the Islamic Jihad that was uh, supposedly able to smuggle a JDAM sized weapon into Gaza and a delivery mechanism which may or may not have been from a plane. Maybe they have a fucking air force too beyond the paragliders. Who knows, dude? Fuck it. YOLO. Let's go crazy. On international law, Professor Yoram Dinstein disagrees. Writing in his International Law of Belligerent Occupation, the proposition that the Israeli occupation in the Gaza Strip is over is not the prevalent opinion, and the present writer cannot possibly accept it. Human Rights Watch puts it even Damn, more- Damn, bro, they got v though? Dude, what? And the present writer. I saw that. Possibly. I saw that. Big homie's got V loan on. Dude, they're dripped up. They're fucking dripped up out there, dude. That's what they're using the billions of dollars on. Okay. You see that? My dude is looking opium right now. He is straight opium. They're balling. Clearly. Clearly, they're balling. I have to. At this point in the day, once we've reached the eight hour mark and i've served you eight top of the hour ad breaks i have to like lighten the the mood a little bit okay v loan is not opium azan i know i know shut the fuck up the correct term is launching system not delivery mechanism sorry launching system drip knows no boundaries drip knows no borders dude v loan funds hamas not clickbait so much of the rhetoric is the absolute perverse idea of Palestinians having to be perfect victims in order to be treated like fucking humans. But they are. They are. They are. In many respects, they are. Like, they fall in the category of perfect victimhood in so many, by so many metrics, okay? Especially when you consider the wonderful people that are struggling 
but still humiliated, yet they still persist in the fucking West Bank and in Gaza too. They do fall in the category of the perfect victim. It's just that you don't nece- you don't necessarily see their humanity, so you can't comprehend them as perfect victims. Not saying you, but like they do. They are an incredibly resilient people. They've gone through so much fucking suffering. It is unimaginable. Anyway, here's the three-minute ad break now. Now you can see what kind of suffering, uh, uh, maybe a fraction of that suffering if you don't have a subscription at the top of the hour. Here's the three-minute ad break now. They accept it. Human Rights Watch puts it even more directly. Whether the Israeli army is inside Gaza or redeployed around its periphery and restricting entrance and exit, it remains in control. And despite what Israel's current information minister, Distal Adbarian, says, the Israeli Supreme Court has held that the West Bank is indeed held by the state of Israel in belligerent occupation. The long arm of the state in the area is the military commander. It's hard to argue with the fact that the continuing occupation, which has been called the world's longest, has brought decreasing material conditions and quality of life for the Palestinians whether through home demolitions, routine raids in the West Bank, the blockade of Gaza, which has left nearly half of its citizens unemployed and 80% of its water unfit for human consumption, to discrimination, to checkpoints, to settlements. The consequences of the June 1967 war are a continuing issue. The justification for the war has been, in turn, the justification for the occupation. Israel holds the land today because they faced certain destruction at the hands of the Arabs. So the Israeli story holds. The conventional wisdom has held that it was only because Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser sought to destroy Israel outright that they launched their preemptive attack on the morning of June 5, 1967. According to Israeli historian Avi Schleim in his mammoth history of Israel, The Iron Wall, the Six-Day War was a defensive war. It was launched by Israel to safeguard its security, not to expand its territory. Okay, yeah. so in 1967, the Arab- Yeah, it just, it just happened to, to work like that, you know what I mean? Arabs mobilized for all-out war. And this includes Egypt, it includes Jordan, it includes Saudi, it includes Syria. This is going to be the big war where they finally get rid of this- I love how much this Mufti gets played. Like, the Palestinian- and Grand Mufti- it is like is like seemingly the most consequential historical figure in in historic Palestine like it, it's just it, it's so ridiculous how how much i i feel like it's just such an obvious way to try and invoke that same holocaust revisionism that Benjamin Netanyahu is famous for to be like yeah he was really anti-semitic he wanted to fucking uh, collaborate with the nazis like that's the one guy and that guy, as far as I understand it, quite literally, wasn't even the guy. There were plenty of guys out there. It, he was just one of the guys that the British mandate uh, uh, put into that position. It's just like, that's the guy, though. You know, he, he went and he met with Hitler. Okay, so did the Leahy uh, brigades, you know? They, they thought that, they could actually uh, align with Nazi Germany. That doesn't mean that fucking Israel uh, in its inception was automatically uh, aligned with Nazi Germany. You know what I mean? So fucking stupid. Yeah, so did, I mean, so did fucking, <laughs> you know, the West with their appeasement, but. This nascent Jewish state that is less than 20 years old. In 1967, the Arabs, led this time by Egypt and joined by Syria and Jordan, once again sought to destroy the Jewish state. Gamal Abdel Nasser mobilized troops in the Sinai Peninsula in hopes of eliminating the country. But what if that weren't true? What does that mean for the conflict? That would mean that the continuing military occupation of the occupied territories began and is still predicated on a lie. Let's look at the evidence. But first, a word from our sponsor, 
Atlas VPN is offering my viewers, for a limited time only, three years of Atlas VPN Premium for only $1.83 per month, plus three months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. I get a lot of emails from viewers who are curious to research the topics of my videos further. But if you are concerned with privacy, especially if you live in a country that closely monitors internet activity, it's important you use a proper VPN to hide your IP address. Atlas VPN also blocks ads and malware, and also phishing links. By surfing the internet privately, you can shop and search Google without worrying about tailored results. Another huge advantage is being able to watch content from streaming services that's only available in other countries. I'm not skipping on purpose. This is an amazing deal for three years Shut of Atlas up. VPN Premium at only a dollar eighty-three cents. I'm doing ethical reacts, okay? Even though this is uh, my friend, I'm still doing ethical reacts, and month. I'm showing you his ad. Okay, this is an ethical react. This is ethical reacts time. Plus three months extra with a thirty-day money-back guarantee. Thank you, Atlas VPN, and thank you for sponsoring this video. The nineteen sixty-seven war needs some context. Just months before the conflict, things had been escalating rapidly between Israel and its neighbors. What was once an atmosphere of animosity descended into a road to war on November 16, 1966. On that day, an armored brigade of 4,000 Israeli troops, accompanied by tanks, launched an attack on the village of Samu in the West Bank, which was then under the control of Jordan a devastating attack which killed 18 Jordanian soldiers. When the first Israeli column reached Samu, the soldiers started a carefully planned destruction of houses and property. Through shelling, airstrikes, and dynamite, the troops destroyed 125 homes, along with other buildings. This marked the most serious escalation of the Arab-Israeli conflict since the 1956 Suez Crisis. Israel claimed that the attack was a reprisal for Palestinian infiltrators crossing into Israel from Jordan. The explanation had little basis in reality, since Jordanian troops had killed more Palestinians crossing into Israel than the Israelis had. Nevertheless, the outcome of the raid was favorable to Israel, since it stoked resentment between the Arab states, especially Egypt and Jordan. Jordan felt that Egypt had failed to come to its defense. The two countries would reconcile, though, reaching a defense pact, which would have important implications in the ensuing Six-Day War. Also in 1966, the Ba'ath Party had come to power in Syria. Their rule would see the adoption of a hardline stance against Israel, and as a result, the Ba'ath regime began sponsoring Palestinian guerrillas to attack its citizens. Though the attacks were, according to former Israeli intelligence chief Yehoshaphat Harkabi, not impressive by any standard. The Israeli establishment would become outwardly hostile in its rhetoric, and reportedly considered attacking or even overthrowing the Syrian government. With Army Chief of Staff Yitzhak Rabin reportedly getting himself in hot water for saying on an Israeli radio show, the moment is coming when we will march on Damascus to overthrow the Syrian government. The situation was close to boiling over, and just two months before the war, Six Syrian fighter jets were shot down by Israeli forces. It's possible Al Jazeera Al Jazeera Al Jazeera claims it was a Hamas bomb accidentally falling back on the hospital. <laughs> it's probably the fake Indian bot guy who was like, "Hello, I love titties," <laughs> and then all of a sudden decided to flip on the. I actually work at Al Jazeera, and I know these are bombs that Hamas threw. <laughs> like literally <laughs> October 6th uh, random account it's gonna take a while sorry one sec yeah October October 6th uh, random account is like I love Sydney sweetie she has the most incredible titties October 7th no uh, you know dead silent <laughs> October 17th hello I am an Al Jazeera reporter and I know I can confirm that the bombs were Hamas bombs that dropped they are saying Israel previously fired artillery shells at hospitals for a warning. Yeah, I mean, they did. Five minutes ago, Israel previously fired artillery shells at hospitals as a warning. A senior health official in Gaza has said that Israel had fired two artillery shells as a warning at the El Ahli Hospital days before it bombed it. I know this because I covered it. Undersecretary of the Ministry of Health, Yusuf Abu Al-Rish, said the hospital was first attacked on Saturday evening, if you recall. Like I said... 
A day later, the Israeli army called the hospital's director and told him, we warned you yesterday with two shells and asked for an evacuation for the facility, according to Abu al-Rish. Speaking at the news conference, surrounded by bodies of the victims, Abu al-Rish held up pictures of the exploded munitions and the damage they left. The only place in the world where people are warned with artillery shells is the Gaza Strip, he said. Most moral army, my fucking ass. Also, how the fuck are we ahead of Al Jazeera on this? I mean, this is, that's actually kind of crazy. They have people on the ground. That's wild. Like, I, I said this this morning. I told you they blew up the hospital on Saturday this morning. <laughs> Al Jazeera is not on top of it because apparently their most important journalists in the Gaza Strip are, are talking about Sidney Sweeney's titties or, or uh, you know, shitting on uh, people in Pakistan in ways that only an Indian person would know how to shit on them suspiciously but i guess maybe it's an indian reporter of al jazeera down in the gaza strip i even checked world news and they didn't have anything either when you know they would have definitely had something if it was confirmed to be hamas so is world news just like unhinged what's going on um is is world I've, i haven't touched reddit for the most part because it's a fucking toxic shithole where people are just you know jumping over one another to uh is, is jumping over one another to be as racist as they physically, humanly possibly can. This is a random retweet of a video. I'm not sure where the original was. Wait, oh my God, is it literally the... Example, world news thread comments are fucking insane. I don't know if I want to see this. Gaza hospital hit by failed Islamic Jihad rocket, says IDF. Man, this is so fucking crazy. Just last night I was watching a live stream. Now down. They had a camera set up there. There were so many people there. The place was so densely populated. People looking calm and placid. Like they had made it to safety. They were just sitting on benches, serving on their phone like nothing was going on. Now it's gone. Hundreds upon hundreds of innocent people in and around a hospital, dead and gone. Hundreds more injured. Oh, they're writing this because they think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, Islamic Jihad that bombed it. When they find out that it's uh, IDF, they're going to turn around and be like, well, they deserved it. There's some video does show a, f a f rocket falling short. I don't know. Definitive. Yes, it does line up. Has anyone even educated themselves about the Hamas rockets? There's literally no guidance at all. Hamas is literally playing with playing the guerrillas video game for the 90s or for targeting. What could go wrong? Oh, that's my favorite. Okay. I will unpack this and then we're going to go back to the fucking uh, GDF video. This is my favorite type of Redditor. The Redditor that has already made up his mind, the Redditor that already is coming at it from like the informed perspective, he's coming at it from the informed perspective and he's moved on and he's like riffing with the other dumbass fucking Redditors who have no fucking clue about what's going on where they're just like literally <gasps> circle jerking as aggressively as they possibly can. Like <laughs> these fucking dumbass Palestinians, they, <laughs> they have no targeting systems. I mean, it's <laughs> of course it happened. Of course they fucking blew up their own hospital. And now... <laughs> and now they're, I mean, what were they expecting with their lack of targeting systems on their weapons? It's like, you don't know anything. You haven't thought about this ever in your life. Why are you just like jerking off with the rest of these fucking dumbasses? <laughs> I'm very smart, by the way. The reason why this is like really, really fucking annoying uh, to me in particular, because I see it so much about speculation on myself as well because like i have those fucking rabbit ass uh uh reddit uh, freaks that literally will like make speculations on my life uh on my on my assertions and then go off of it and make secondary assertions off of that that are just so entirely incorrect it's just like don't you also not know anything? Do you not know who blew up the hospital with 100% certainty? No, so admit that and be fair. Yes, I do not know who blew up the hospital with 100% certainty. But what I do know is, for example, it wasn't a meteor, okay? I know that it wasn't a meteor attack. I can rule that out, right? There wasn't a meteor shower there. But you know what was happening there, at least according to on-the-ground reporting and the people that were victim to the bombing that were there, that, uh, that experienced it and have been experiencing it for the past fucking seven days of relentless bombing campaigns, that Israel was doing a bombing campaign there. A missile salvo coming from the Palestinian side in or around that same fucking time frame does not change that reality. So yeah, that's why I'm making an assertion here that I believe is educated. That is my opinion on the matter. Yes. Who do I, who could it be? Bro, the, you know what this is? Anytime we have this fucking conversation about foreign policy, when, when, when there is a, when there is like an analysis or the, the, the bubble, the, the state department bubble is decided 
that by the way thank you for um thank you for for re re blah, thank you for replying uh in a reasonable capacity so uh, anytime this happens I feel like I'm losing my fucking mind. Everyone always goes back to like, Hassan, you said Russia would never invade Ukraine, right? But like beyond that, this is, it, it is, it reminds me of the time when everyone was like, Havana syndrome is real. It reminds me of the time when everyone was like, no, Jeffrey Epstein did kill himself. It reminds me of the time when, uh, uh, no, the Bolivian elections were actually uh, not uh, facilitated with a coup d'etat. And they were actually, uh, you know, there was no coup d'etat in Bolivia. It was totally valid. It was, it reminds me of the time when people were like, no, the Nord Stream pipeline was bombed by Russia. Like, it's so odd that every single time people just basically come in here and, and desperately try to rehash and, and repeat that with the, the narratives that they've seen in mainstream media without really putting another, uh, you know, a, a second of thought into it, a second of critical thought into it. It's like, dude, it makes no fucking sense. Like, it literally makes no sense. And then it comes out that, like, it's not true, but by that point, we've moved on to the next thing that I'm certainly definitely wrong about, but the mainstream media has gotten right. It's just, it's so, it's so weird. Nobody ever fucking engages in self-reflection. I did when I got the, the, the prediction of Russia invading Ukraine wrong, 100%. I engaged in self-reflection. I wanted to make sure that I don't make a mistake like that again. Okay? Why won't you? Also, stop sending me fucking tweets from Jackson Dinkle. Okay, I don't give a fuck how many impressions he farms off of, like, pro-Palestinian tweets. Possible that this air... Motherfucker went to Russia, like, and, and sat on top of a tank to act like he's, like, actually fighting and pushing Z that hard. Get the fuck out of here. War II was instigated by Israel. Though he wouldn't admit it publicly at the time, Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Dayan would privately tell reporter Rami Tal the truth in 1976. It would be published 21 years later, after Dayan had already died. I know how at least 80% of the clashes there started. In my opinion, more than 80%. It went this way. We would send a tractor to plow someplace in the demilitarized area and knew in advance that the Syrians would start to shoot. If they didn't shoot, we would tell the tractor to advance farther until in the end, the Syrians get annoyed and shoot. And then we would use artillery and later the air force. Israel's strategy of escalation on the Syrian front was probably the single most important factor in dragging the Middle East to war in June 1967. Surprisingly, Moshe Dayan appeared to agree. The nature and scale of our reprisal actions against Syria and Jordan had left Nasser with no choice but to defend his image and prestige throughout the Arab world, thereby setting off a train of escalation in the entire Arab region. This escalation culminated in Nasser moving troops into the Sinai and cutting off the Straits of Tehran, which proved to it's been four hours since the IDF said they have proof of Hamas the culprit of the hospital bombing. Adobe Special is working overtime tonight. Yeah, I'm surprised that they haven't released it yet. Like, how hard is it to find a dude that speaks Arabic to be like, yeah, dude, it was so crazy, bro, when we did that, when we bombed the hospital ourselves. Oh, my God, it was so sick. Don't highlight they, like, the IDF. They as in the normal grammar, you fucking idiots. Not like they as in the Jews. The fuck? <laughs> I like that we have we've moved on. It's like, wow, dude, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Hassan being quite <laughs> quite anti-Semitic by using proper grammar? What the fuck? Even though I think it's incredibly unlikely that the hospital was bombed by Hamas or Islamic Jihad accidentally, it is funny to me that the IDF is basically saying only they get to kill Palestinians and it's fucked up when anyone else does it. Remove funny, ain't nothing funny about this, bro. Listen, you have to fucking... You have to you have to find humor in the darkness somehow. Earlier today, I shared a report that published on Reuters about the bombing of the hospital in Gaza, which falsely stated that Israel struck the hospital. I mistakenly shared this information in a since deleted post in which I referred uh, reference Hamas's routine use of hospitals to store weapon caches and conduct terrorist activity. I apologize for this error. Also, the IDF does not bomb hospitals. I assumed Israel was targeting one of the Hamas bases in Gaza. It is known that Hamas is using... Dude, what the fuck? Even is this... Wait, what? 
first of all, he didn't do that at all. He did not share a Reuters report. And and secondly, wait, what do you mean? This also doesn't make sense. This this answer, this this is so stupid. This literally fucking still is saying like, but if it did, oh here, by the way, someone someone ripping into technical appreciator Army Strang, co-host of the podcast Hell of a Way, uh, alongside with Indies Deserts, uh, <laughs> making fun of the final conclusion of Geo Confirmed. So a missile exploded in midair, and then a piece of that already exploded missile hit a hospital and killed hundreds of people. This is the fucking this is the absolute fucking dumbass that you guys are uh, putting forward as your as your conclusive uh, analyzer, okay? God fucking damn it, brother. Jesus Christ, that's how stupid. How fucking stupid. White House, oh, here's a additional uh here's an additional take. White House won't say if they believe Israel's explanation that Islamic Jihad was behind the strike in the hospital. Israel feels very strongly they did not cause it. NSC's Kirby said they categorically and very stridently denied. Bro, what are we doing? What are we doing? What the fuck are we doing? What's going on here? Are you fucking insane? Oh, dude, never mind. Israel said they didn't do it. Okay, uh, sick then. That's like that probably magically materialized on its own. Geo confirm is such a bullshit ass page. No, brother, it's called Geo confirm. So obviously they know what the fuck they're talking about. Okay, they 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 pontificated on this uh, a lot. They put a lot of thought into this. What Evan Hill posted another thing. What did he say? Important to note that the unverified theory being promoted by people on here that an intercepted rocket fragment fell on the Al Ahli hospital and killed hundreds of people is not the IDF's official explanation, which is a failed rocket launch. Exactly. Which also is not a good enough explanation for the magnitude of the fucking explosion, which is what may, which is what is guiding my assertion, okay? Asked if the U.S. was giving Israel the benefit of the doubt, Kirby paused a bit, Betsy Klein reports. I think we certainly recognize that they feel very so strongly that this was not caused by them. I want to fucking, oh my God. Oh my God. Part of me is worried that I'm going to get fucking killed at TwitchCon. And the other part of me is like, well, at least I won't have to ever hear about shit like this ever again if that happens, okay? Jesus Christ. Fucking holy shit, dude. Why do they feel the need to keep repeating they don't target hospitals? That's making me think they target hospitals. Because they do target hospitals. For the past week, they've said they target hospitals. They've told the hospitals they're targeting them. They bombed the hospital that they bombed. I'm losing my fucking mind. I'm losing my mind. They do target hospitals. And then they say Hamas was there. You're finally going to reverse your position when the BBC reports that the idea of pinky swears that they didn't bomb the hospital. I'm not, I'm going to be honest with you, dude. I told you what my, I told you what I'm at. Okay. I told you where I'm at. I told you over and over again today, my standard for this not being uh, uh, an Israeli bombing is understandably a bit high, okay? I need conclusive evidence from a third party, not the IDF, and not the media hacks that just repeat whatever the fuck the IDF is saying. I need a third party analysis from an independent person who is 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 who has a long history of doing forensic investigations that have gone against the State Department line, like Evan Hill. This is a person I pointed to. This is a person I place a lot of importance in. He was on the team that uncovered the Kabul bombing. Okay? Couldn't the explosion be from the military artillery underneath the hospital? That's why there was smoke and then there was a massive explosion? <sighs> yes. Except that's not what secondary explosions look like when you have munitions. A munition storage has has blown up in Ukraine and in other parts of the world in the past. It's not the first time. There was only one fucking explosion. If there was an actual munitions depot down there, a lot of the explosives would start firing off in every direction. You would see it. There would not be a single detonation. There would be multiple detonations. Now, having said that, Having said that, even if there were munitions under this hospital, which I don't believe there are, 
Thank you, Elint News, who is a good OSINT account. It looks more like fireworks factory when you hit a munitions depot, not like the hospital strike. Thank you. It Even if there were munitions under the hospital, which I do not believe there are, but there could be, it still does not justify hitting the hospital unless you are a psychopath, <laughs> okay? That is insane. But none of the none of the the explosions that you saw indicate that there were munitions there anyway. Obama been real quiet lately. Yeah. You know what? That is actually true. I haven't heard a thing from him and I do know he has a tendency to bomb hospitals. He is a fan of that. To be the nail in the coffin. And on June 5th, war broke out. When the Israelis launched the surprise offensive, they attacked on a Monday, knowing that on Wednesday, the Egyptians... Nobody has any idea what happened. People are just going, Oh, brother, we do have an idea of what happened. I'm losing my fucking mind. No, you can't say that it is like, oh, it's a 50-50 split. There, it's like there's 99% evidence pointing in one direction, and the 1% evidence on the other direction is the bombing campaign facilitator saying, we didn't do this one. That's it. That's it. There is no evidence. There, the only evidence that everyone's pointing to is some fucking limp dick OSINT account that was literally saying a fallen piece of shrapnel caused the largest explosive, most damaging strike so far in 75 years of conflict. I'm losing my mind. Yes. This, uh, yeah, so a missile exploded in midair, then a piece of that already exploded missile hit a hospital and killed hundreds of people. It's crazy. But guys, you don't understand. He posted, he put lines there. Look, look, look at the lines. <laughs> yeah, a more likely scenario than this, which is definitely not what happened, okay? If you believe that this is what happened, you are a stupid person. I will say that, okay? You are not a fabulist. You are a stupid person, a more likely situation than this one to show you how unlikely it is is that IDF uh, or Hamas snuck into Israel with one of the tunnels that Israel did not bomb and they put on IDF uniforms. They learned how to fly or rather operate whichever, whichever uh, you know, whichever way they fucking deployed this weapon, okay? Whichever uh, way they dropped this missile and, and they guided an American-provided missile at their own hospital to blame the IDF. That is literally, that is literally more likely than this, than the, the fucking stupid fucking thread that so many of you dummies sent in here. Like, I'm losing it. Yeah, exactly. Just as a reminder, prior to the most recent bombing, Israel had already bombed 22 hospitals in the previous nine days. Devil's advocate, could it have failed? Could it have been a failed launch and it exploded on the ground and there was a strike that happened simultaneously that hit a different site that caused the sound we heard in the video? Okay, dude. I guess you nailed it. Yeah. It was, no, actually, they strapped comical levels of TNT on their chest and said, let's go kill everyone at this hospital, okay? Because they love doing stuff like that. They're just big goofsters over there, okay? They did that, and then Israel was like, oh, shit, god damn it. We literally just, we just sent a JDAM in a totally separate direction at the same exact time that that explosive uh, uh, detonation occurred. I don't know, maybe it was a Chinese space laser. Have you guys put a lot of thought into that? Many, many people are saying that Chinese space laser... Dude, you know what's fucking crazy about this? You know what's fucking nuts about this? This argument literally is the same as being like, uh, the Hawaiian wildfires were caused by global warming. Uh, no, thank you. I think it was a Chinese space laser. But of course, in, in the fog of war, okay... In a relentless bombing campaign, if Israel claims that they didn't do it, then everybody fucking turns into the QAnon hunters, dude. It's it's so nutty. I think the fact that Kirby wasn't willing to even flat out say we're giving them the benefit of the doubt speaks volumes. Yeah, it speaks volumes to how fucking deeply and unimaginably cucked the American military is, okay? That they're just like, they're so, they're so insane, that they, they won't even go, dude, yes, stop. Like, what the fuck? It's our bombs that's doing this. What are you doing? We're going to cut the fucking bomb. We're going to cut the bomb faucet and the money faucet. Egyptian vice president would arrive in Washington to talk about reopening the Strait of Tehran. 
We might not have succeeded in getting Egypt to reopen the strait, but it was a real possibility. The Six-Day War was the most spectacular military victory in Israel's history. It is true. On the morning of Monday, June 5th. It's like, I, I would say it's like akin, I feel like it's akin to America running on, resting on the laurels of like World War II, you know what I mean? Israel launched a surprise first strike against Egypt's air force. Egypt had no fortified bunkers to speak of, leaving its entire fleet exposed. The strike wiped out 90% of its planes, just sitting on the ground. And just like that, virtually the entire Egyptian air force was destroyed in less than two hours. When Jordan and Syria joined the war, their air forces were wiped out that same afternoon. Even an Iraqi airfield near the Jordanian border was obliterated. In all, more than 400 enemy planes were destroyed in a day. In one fell swoop, Israel now enjoyed total air superiority against all its neighbors. The UN Security Council introduced a ceasefire the next day, June 6th. By Friday, June 9th, five days into the war, Israel had defeated the ground forces of Egypt and Jordan, capturing Gaza, the West Bank, and Arab East Jerusalem. Now Jordan, Egypt, and Syria all agreed to cease hostilities, but the Israeli offensive continued. Having already captured the Sinai, the West Bank, and Gaza, Israel continued its offensive on- Dude, this is, this is, when you, when you read about Israel's military operations on largely civilian populations, you realize, like, they've been ruthless since day one. Like, Diving a little bit deeper into the Nakba last night, uh, beyond the things I knew about already and the things I'd read about, it it blows my mind how similar it, it blows my mind how similar the operations are right now in Gaza, all the way down to like prior warnings and also engaging in psyops. Like one of the things that they did, I think it was in Haifa, where uh, they went into the town. This was after uh, uh, Deir Yassin, which was a ruthless massacre that very quickly traveled all across uh, the the entire countryside. Every every Palestinian and every village was familiar with the brutality that people experienced, the Palestinians experienced there. But they would go in with their guns, they would shoot a couple people, they would start like opening up fire to the civilian population, and then they had like these 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 trucks where. Uh, they had these trucks where they would uh, blast rocket uh, or, or machine gun fire sounds to make it seem like it was even more, uh, to make it seem like it was even crazier than it actually was in an effort to basically take, they would, par they would close off every other exit from the town and they would push people directly from one exit and they would forcibly expel them. In other towns, they would go in and drop with a plane flyers saying, you know, we're coming for you. You need to leave by tomorrow night. Uh, and then do the exact same thing. They were just like kettle and corral. An entire group of, uh, an entire civilian population from a village forcibly expelling them. And, and, and it was obviously incredibly ruthless. I mean, 15,000 by most conservative estimates of Palestinians died in the process. Obviously there was also, uh, Obviously, there was also uh, fighting happening, like defensive fighting happening from Palestinians at the time. I think they killed like 6,000 people, but like the Israeli forces, well, not Israeli, this is before even, um, the, the uh, Zionist brigades were, were very openly committing acts of terror. They were very openly committing acts of terror on a, on a largely civilian population that had no military experience, barely any weapons whatsoever. And these guys were trained by the British police force, were armed. Some of them, in 1948, at that point, had already fought in World War II. So they literally had, like, actual military training. So they were able to create, like, massive military operations, like a standing military, and, and utilized a standing military force with actual combat experience against a largely civilian population. That level of brutality is unimaginable. And they don't stop. They're like, they're like a pit bull. Like the, the, the way I dis, the way I feel about the way I feel about like Israel's 
military prowess or rather their military tactics uh, historically has been so incredibly ruthless. Like there's no other way to describe it. Ravenous is a good uh, way to describe it where they just, they fucking, they, they don't stop. They just, once they fucking put their teeth in you, they just like literally keep going and going and going and going and going. And it's like so unimaginably cruel. It is relentless. Like it is, it is punishing with the might of God. And I don't know. I don't know how to, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like in some ways it's not as ruthless or as bad as like, uh, you know, the, the colonial powers and what they have done in Africa. And in other ways, it's, it's so cruel and so unusual given its proximity to like contemporary history. It is, it, it was a, it, it, it felt like, like a revenge campaign almost, even though these guys had nothing to do with the Holocaust, obviously. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. And, and they've done it, over and over again in every in every uh every single military campaign that they've launched against largely civilian populations two explosions at the site fits with the rocket failing and the motor propellant being one and the warhead the other <laughs> the current evidence doesn't fit an airstrike got it thanks man that's how that's how it works you're right it's the most powerful bomb it's the singular most powerful bomb ever exploded you know that right like when you say stuff like that, especially when you watch the rocket explode in midair, let's continue. On the northern front to capture the Syrian Golan Heights. This move ultimately cost Israel its diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. Did Israel invade Syria to safeguard its security? Interestingly enough, an Israeli historian Avi Schleim's same book where he claims the Six Day War was a defensive war he cites Moshe Dayan's posthumous interview where he describes the Syrian so-called threat. You don't strike at the enemy because he is a bastard, but because he threatens you. And the Syrians, on the fourth... And that Deir Yassin massacre is the one the Hamas founder witnessed as a kid. He even talked about how this incident affected him deeply. I will tell you one aspect of the Deir Yassin massacre, according to eyewitness uh, uh, Palestinians that were able to escape. Okay. They lined up all the civilians. First of all, Deir Yassin already had a truce of peace with the neighboring Jewish villages. So they did not expect there to be any kind of military combat happening in that village. They did not think that they would be forcibly expelled. So they, it was completely a sneak attack, a surprise attack. They went into the village. They started rounding people up. They started shooting them. There was rapes uh, happening. Uh, they were taking ears like just horrifying things, throwing people in wells and whatnot. There was a moment where they took a father and a son at gunpoint and there was an oven that was on fire. And they told the father to throw his son in the oven. He, of course, did not comply. When he refused to do so, they hit him in the head, they beat him up, and then they threw his son in the oven anyway. And then after they threw his son in the oven, they threw the father in the oven. It was atrocities like this that were committed in Deir Yassin that traveled far and wide. That was one of the reasons why so many people can say, oh, well, they just left on their own volition because they did not want to experience whenever the Israeli military would show up at your fucking doorstep. They did not want to... Dude, you can't... Dude, I love the... The dude doing... Oh, that's like what Hamas does to Jews. Yeah. But Hamas does the Jews. Dude, that's not, we're not talking about Hamas right now, brother. We're, this is 1947 and 1948, okay? Shut the fuck up. You are not going to believe what they turned the village into after they wiped it out? I do know what they turned it into. Um, the Yassin. Oh, they did the fucking Genghis Khan shit. Most of the, uh, most of the villages that they wiped out entirely, they destroyed and planted trees on top of it in order to, like, destroy any remnants of history that lived there, that, that existed there. Despite protests, the Jerusalem neighborhood of Givat Shaul Bet was built on what had been Deir Yassin's land, now considered a part of Harnaf, an Orthodox area. Four Jewish scholars, uh, oh, they, they, they uh, built a, a, a Jewish neighborhood on top of it. 
Many of the village houses on the hill are still standing and have been incorporated into an Israeli hospital for the mentally ill that was established on the site. Some houses outside the fence of the hospital grounds are used for residential and commercial purposes or as warehouses. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that they did was... One of the things that they did on these fucking... Uh, in, in some of the villages is they planted European trees like pine trees in order to Europeanize uh, those areas just to like ensure that uh, no remnants of Arab, Arab culture remained. Yeah, they built a popular beach over a mass grave. Yeah, anyway. Let's Fourth day of the war were not a threat to us. The war is often talked about for its lightning speed, show of military might, and the territory gained. But one overlooked detail is the massive displacement that followed the Israeli offensive. You see here how the war has destroyed the lives of thousands of families, uprooting them from their homes. Uh-oh. Lebanon. State Department authorized the department departure of family members and U.S. government personnel from the U.S. Embassy in Lebanon. Uh-oh. That's probably not good. When American Jewish kids go to plant a tree in Israel, are they having them cover this shit up and tricking them into participating in this shit? I don't know. But someone in the chat said in Hebrew school, or uh, they taught them what? Or was it? What was the other chatter who said, people who say this is a religious war are wrong, right? Yes, of course it's not a fucking religious war. That's ridiculous. I can't find the guy who said it. Oh, here it is. I vaguely remember... Some Hebrew school propaganda about Israel planting trees that make the desert green at its inception. Can you explain why this is bad news? Uh, well, I always operate under the assumption that the American State Department has, uh, uh, you know, a better understanding of the situation on the ground than I do on Twitter. And therefore, they know something that we don't. What do they know? What's in Lebanon? Hezbollah is in Lebanon. Why would they want uh, people to leave Lebanon? Why would they want uh, U.S. government personnel and some non-emergency personnel from the U.S. Embassy in in Lebanon to leave? Well, maybe because they know what Israel does whenever, uh, you know, uh, they decide uh, someone is an entire, an entire nation is an enemy combatant. It could be for two reasons. One, because Israel is going to launch a bombing campaign once Hezbollah retaliates. Or two, uh, the protests are happening at the American embassy and the protests are, uh, the protests are happening everywhere and they don't know if they can even uh, protect their staff. Can Israel do anything without the U.S.'s approval? I mean, yes and no. People might be thinking or operating on that the bombing is done by the U.S. I don't think the bombing was done by the U.S., but I think every bombing that Israel does is basically a U.S. bomb. So therefore, technically, the bombing is done by the U.S. Roads throughout the West Bank were crammed with long columns of refugees. Civilians desperately crossed rivers through shattered bridges hoping to seek refuge in Jordan. At a cabinet meeting, Defense Minister Moshe Dayan was overjoyed with the number of refugees. I hope they all go. If we could achieve the departure of 300,000 without pressure, that would be a great blessing. The Nakba, or the major ethnic cleansing campaign of 1948, was less than 20 years earlier. Still fresh and vivid memories of massacres, such as the one at Deir Yassin, compelled many thousands to flee. After the war, they would not be allowed to return. As in 1948, Israeli forces made use of psychological warfare units who blared messages over loudspeakers mounted on jeeps, commanding yeah. the Arabs to leave their homes. One operation in the city of Kalkilia forced out as many as 12,000 people and destroyed over 800 homes. The instructions were clear. Evacuate the residents and destroy the place. This pattern continued throughout the conflict. Among the largest villages cleansed were Imwas, Yalu, and Beit Nuba. According to Israel's own estimates, the war produced as many as 250,000 refugees. Adding to the more than 700,000 produced as a result From of the, the Nakba, Nakba the tally of displacement grew considerably as a result of this short but bloody and devastating conflict. We've just Where did the Zionist we uh, forces get their weapons from? Uh, hello, England, uh, British military. And also, they, uh, 
I think they also snuck them in as well. Like uh, aftermath of World War II, there was a, a lot of opportunity to just like get it uh, Ill illicitly. Uh, how does the U.S. Biden spin this bombing during his visit? I don't even fucking know how the America. I don't know how America does anything anymore. Discuss the Syrian threat, but the principal threat, according to the Israelis, underscored by their first strike, was Egypt. So. Did Israel really face imminent destruction from Egypt? In 1967, the dictator of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, announced his plan, in his words, to destroy Israel. In 1971, the now retired Lyndon Johnson would publish hey, yo, a political memoir of the presidential match. Let's years. Go. Regarding the Six Day War, Johnson would speak candidly about Egypt, which was at the time known as the United Arab Republic, or UAR. During the evening of May 26, I met with Israel's foreign minister, Abba Eban, who said that according to Israeli intelligence, the United Arab Republic was preparing an all-out attack. I asked Secretary McNamara to give Mr. Eban a summary of our findings. Three separate intelligence groups had looked carefully into the matter, McNamara said, and it was our best judgment that a UAR attack was not imminent. Abba Eban's own autobiography, published the next year, indeed included the shocking admission that Nasser did not want war. He wanted victory without war. A similarly worded summary can be found from, amazingly, the chief of Israel's foreign intelligence service, the Mossad. Egypt was not ready for a war, and Nasser did not want a war. Even top military brass went against the official version. In a speech proclaiming Israel's victory on June 12th, Prime Minister Levi Eshkol declared, the Arab leader's hopes of exterminating Israel were dashed. The first challenge to this myth reportedly began with Major General Matityahu Pelet in front of an audience at the Zatfa Club in Tel Aviv. The crowd reportedly went into a shock when they heard the now-retired general say, the thesis according to which the danger of genocide hung over us and Israel was fighting for her very physical survival was nothing but a bluff which was born and bred after the war. Pellet had an interesting reason for speaking so bluntly. He was actually offended by people saying that. To pretend that the Egyptian forces were capable of threatening Israel's existence not only insults the intelligence of any person capable of analyzing this kind of situation, but is primarily an insult to the Zahal, meaning the Israeli army, Several other generals then followed suit. There never was a danger of extermination, said Ezra Weissman, who commanded the Israeli Air Force during its devastating first strike against Egypt. We were not threatened with genocide on the eve of the Six-Day War, and we never thought of such a possibility, observed General and Deputy Chief of Staff Haim Barlev. And we can't forget the Chief of Staff... Pellet's son is anti-Zionist now? That's not surprising. There are even there are even anti-Zionists that were were. I mean, yeah. It, it, the the closer you are in proximity, the closer you are in proximity to like the cruelty that is happening, the more you you, the more refreshed your perspective is on the atrocities. The more you uh, can't turn a blind eye to it. Staff, as as opposed to like the Jerusalem lady who was like, "Oh, I'm making gluten-free cookies for the IDF." who was none other than future Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Yeah, unless you're fucking, uh, what's his name? Is it Yair Netanyahu, a Bibi's son, who is like fucking straight up a 4chan groiper, who literally is like, loves posting Nazi memes and shit. Who told Le Monde in May 1972, I do not believe that Nasser wanted war. And finally, from the mouth of another Prime Minister. During his tenure in 1982, Menachem Begin stated flatly, the Egyptian army concentrations in the Sinai approaches did not prove that Nasser was really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. More than half a century of military occupation. While time seemed to have a somewhat civilizing effect on South or apartheid South Africa, the Palestinians have not shaken their subjugation. In fact, it has only become gravely worse with time. It came as a shock to the Western world when the Second Intifada broke out, on the heels of the Second Oslo Accords, which was seen as such a triumphant success for Jews and Arabs alike. 
But whereas the Palestinians once upon a time were able to say, drive from Ramallah to Jerusalem in under a half hour, or travel from Gaza to the West Bank, new checkpoints, walls, and- Good thing that uh, the, the Israeli funded and Israeli propped up and uh, newly radicalized group that, uh, you know, as we found out, as we learned about yesterday, used to be a simple charity that was like uh, polling at around 3% popularity, was out there throwing fucking bombs uh, during this uh, during this discussion. And Israeli permits almost impossible to attain blocked their free movement. Arabs now use different buses, roads, even using different license plates, causing the progressive constriction of Palestinian life. Indeed, things only got worse after Oslo. More than half a million settlers now reside in the West Bank, with no sign of slowing down. Bulldozing house. Two of my friends who were killed last Saturday were anti-occupation peace activists and spent the entire past year and much of their short lives speaking up against Bibi and the occupation. Their memories being used by a government they hated as an excuse to kill Gazans makes me so angry. Sorry for your loss, my friend. One day it will be better. I hope. Your voices are heard. There are plenty. There are, there are other victims and other family members of, of, of victims who are channeling that exact, same, that exact same message right now. ...houses to pave way for new ones. And with the new Israeli regime more hardline than ever, the prospect of full annexation of the West Bank seems more and more likely. By taking the civil administration of the West Bank out of the hands of the military and into civilian control, it will be administered by the federal government of Israel, with the help of its major patron, the United States. In 2019, the Trump administration officially recognized the Syrian Golan Heights as being under the full sovereignty of Israel. When asked by the press if this sets a dangerous precedent... Oh yeah, they fucking... Fun fact, you know, they do love, they do love Trump. Trump is the most popular politician in Israel, you know? Well, I, followed by Joe Biden, Joe Brandon. Secretary Joe of Brandon. State Mike Pompeo cited none other than the June 1967 war. Israel was fighting a defensive battle to save its nation. I need your help. This channel relies on donations and patrons. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching this video. If you want to support me and what I do, please consider becoming a patron. GDF is, uh, you know, makes bangers after bangers. Anyway, um, I think at nine hours at this point, I'm going to uh, run the last three minute ad break here and uh, wish you all a good night. And, uh, you know, we will, we will get more information, hopefully a confirmation possibly by tomorrow. Hopefully when I, I mean, I'll be, I'll be monitoring the situation closely. I hope that there is, uh, no immediate retaliation. Who knows what will happen tomorrow at this point. Iran has made numerous, uh, Iran has, has said numerous times the time is up and that they're going to retaliate.